will, look with me in your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 41 as we continue our reading commentary through the prophet Ezekiel. We've been looking at the vision that the Lord gave to Ezekiel of a temple of which no one has ever seen an actual physical building of the size of this temple to this exact dimension that we find here. And so for this reason, those that have studied this have come to the conclusion that this must be a spiritual temple that the Lord was revealing unto Ezekiel, much like he did to John in the book of Revelation, the heavenly city, because this temple is laid out like a city. And so just like any other portion of scripture as we read it, we're to discern how this would have been a type of the Lord Jesus Christ and how God is to be worshiped through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, last time we were in Ezekiel 41 and we read down to verse 11 and the Lord willing will finish up this chapter in this reading from verse 12 down to verse 26. Now, as the temple's laid out, it had a gate to the north, it had a gate to the south, and it had a gate to the east, but there's no gate in this temple in the west. And that's because the building of the temple itself backed right up to the wall, where you would have thought maybe there'd be a gate, but there isn't. And of course, you can look at the entry the eastern gate, how Christ came in as the sun rises from the east. He's the, he's the rising sun, the sun of righteousness. And uh, some perceive even the exiting to the north as a picture of his ascension into glory when he had finished his work. There's a lot here that is symbolic that we could spend a long time studying. But here in verse 12, of Ezekiel 41, it says, Now the building that was before the separate place at the end toward the west was 70 cubits broad, and the wall of the building was five cubits thick round about, and the length thereof 90 cubits. Remember, a cubit is about 18 inches. And so when you look at that, here it's speaking of a large building that stood up against the wall on the west, facing the temple courtyard. So from the east would have been the temple courtyard, which again is a place where it represents where today Jew and Gentile are drawn to worship God. And there's no wall of division as there had been. But this particular building that's described here, when you break down the cubits, it was about 122 and a half feet wide. So imagine 122 and a half feet wide, and it would have been 157 and a half feet long. And when it says here that the length thereof 90 cubits, or it should say, uh, I meant to say the wall of the building was five cubits thick round about, that would be about a wall that's eight and three quarter inches thick, big thick wall. And so this building that faced the separate, the separating courtyard at its western end, the western side of the temple complex not having any gate, then it could only face eastward and it stood at its western end, the wall and the building with the five cubits thick, this was a substantial building with real measurable dimensions. And again, I think of what the Lord told Moses when he gave him the pattern for the earthly tabernacle. He said to make it exactly as he had given it down to the very dimensions as the Lord revealed it, why? Because it's all a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one thing is to be altered. There are people today that think when it comes to 
the Lord that each one can come as they will and interpret him as they will. No. Even as we see here the specifications of this particular temple and building, it's because it's all significant as to how God is to be approached, how God is to be worshipped through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verses 13 to 17, then, we have the features of the temple that are described. And the temple building as a whole. It says here in verse 13, So he measured the house, an hundred cubits long, and a separate place, and the building with the walls thereof, an hundred cubits long. Also the breadth of the face of the house, and of the separate place toward the east, an hundred cubits. You kind of get an idea that we're looking at something square here. Perfectly square. He measured the length of the building over against the separate place, which was behind it, and the galleries thereof on the one side and on the other side, and hundred cubits. So if you're plotting this on a graph, it wouldn't be hard to see that we're looking at a perfect square with the inner temple and the porches and the court. And then it says the doorposts and the narrow windows and the galleries round about on their three stories. Remember, that's where we saw where the priests were to have their abode. And again, it's a picture of dwelling in Christ that each one has their place. Just like Christ said, I go to pre prepare a place for you. And in my father's house, the translator said, are many mansions, but really what it is, many dwellings, but one house where God is to be served and worshiped through the priesthood. We see in the New Testament where Christ has made of his church a kingdom of priests who dwell together in him. And over against the door, sealed with wood round about and from the ground up to the windows, and the windows were covered to that above the door, even unto the inner house, and without and by all the wall, about within and without measure. So we see where he measured this temple, 100 cubits long, the separating courtyard with the building and its walls being 100 cubits long, and the width of the eastern face of the temple, including the separating courtyard, 100 cubits, and he measured the length of the building Behind it, facing the separating court that we just read about up in verse 12, with its galleries and on the one side and on the other side, 100 cubits. So all of these were measured. When he measured the temple, 100 cubits long, the temple building itself would have been 172 feet long when you break down the cubits, or in meters, about 52.5 meters. And so the man that measured this temple, that means this would have been 175 feet long, around 172, courtyard around the building, 175 feet, 172, depending on how you count it, and uh, the temple and the building to the west, as well as the doorposts that are mentioned here. They had beveled window frames, and Ezekiel, and the one, remember, the man, the mysterious man taking him on his tour. <laughs> Don't you know you would have loved to have been there to be able to see this? Not anything physical, but the Lord opening his eyes to know that this was none other than the Lord Jesus himself that was revealing this unto Ezekiel. And uh, therefore, in pointing out all these dimensions and the and how they're, they're uh, square, fitly framed together. We've seen that already in Ephesians chapter 2. That this tour, if you will, that Ezekiel is receiving is, is by none other than the, than the designer himself. Sometimes you look at buildings and you think, I wonder what went through the mind of the designer. Well, you don't need to wonder here because this was the Lord himself. And so verses 18 to 20 we see the designs now mentioned here 
on this temple building. It says, and it was made with cherubims and palm trees, just like the temple of old, just like the tabernacle. So that a palm tree was between a cherub and a cherub, and every cherub had two faces. So that the face of a man was toward the palm tree on the one side and the face of a young lion toward the palm tree on the other side. And it was made through all the house round about from the ground unto above the door were cherubims and palm trees made and on the wall of the temple. So here we see a design and it was made with a cherubim, the cherubim represent the presence of God where the angels are around the throne night and day singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And then the palm trees, which represent life. The design of the palm tree has been noted throughout this temple here. And it was also featured in Solomon's temple in 1 Kings 6, and then the design of the cherubim, that's prominent both in the previous tabernacle and also in the temple. But again, these dimensions don't fit anything of those former temples, not even the one that was built again by Zerubbabel when they came back from captivity. And so we conclude that what we're to remember here is the symbolism that the angels represent the very presence of God and the palm trees represent the work of Christ. He's that blessed man that is planted by the rivers of water and brings forth fruit in its season. And just like we know the angels serve God, well, who is Christ but God? And so you see both of these Together Now it says here that each cherub, verse 19, had two faces. One was the face of a man and the other a face of a young lion. I believe there we have a description of the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, but also of his humanity. He was both God and man. And so in this temple that... Ezekiel is seen here, the face of a man and the face of a young lion. Christ is the lion of Judah, and he's the God-man. The cherubim here are described in uh, Ezekiel 10, 14, and also in Revelation 4, 7, as having four faces. But here, too, the four faces are noted and depicted in this design. And so I believe, again, just as the temple is a type of Christ, the courtyard, everything about it represents his church that he would build. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll build it again. He was talking about his body. Here we have illustrated the attributes of Christ, even through this temple and this symbolism. He was to be both man and God and therefore to accomplish the work of God on behalf of that people that the Father gave him. This was, this was the foundation that was to be laid, upon which no other foundation can be laid or made than Jesus Christ. And then verses 21 and 22, here it refers to a table before the Lord. It says the posts of the temple were squared, Everything about Christ is perfection. The posts represent his strength, the pillar upon which truth is founded. Paul wrote to Timothy about that, that the church was the pillar of truth. Well, he's talking about Christ. It's Christ's church. And the face of the sanctuary, the appearance of the one is the appearance of the other. So everything symmetrical. As if you're looking in a mirror. And the altar of wood was three cubits high and the length thereof two cubits and the corners thereof and the length thereof and the walls thereof were of wood 
And he said unto me, this is the table that is before the Lord. So here we have square columns, pillars, at the entrance of the sanctuary. And the ones at the entrance of the most holy place were similar. So the pillars that were at the entry of the sanctuary and then the ones going into the most holy place, the same exact similarity. Well, that doesn't surprise, surprise us because every part of this pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here was an altar made of wood. The cubits that it mentions here, this would be about five and a quarter feet high and about three and a half feet across the corners. And the sides were all made of wood. And it says this, again, the Lord told him, is the table that stands in the Lord's presence. Well, we know in the old temple, there was an altar that stood in the, the Lord's presence. In other words, in, the, in front of the, the veil, that uh, separated the holy place from the most holy place. And uh, so likely here, this one that's mentioned, it wasn't an altar for sacrifices, but rather would have been a table of incense. This would have been the, the one that stood in the presence of the Lord. And the incense that was represented on this table standing in the holy place, just outside the most holy place, that's where in the old temple, the altar of incense would, was found. So I believe that's what's being described here when uh, it mentions this being the table that is before the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant was where the mercy seat was, and this was before the Lord. <clears throat> and then, and again, that represents the prayers of our Lord, his intercession on behalf of his people, and anything brought before the Lord was offered up through Christ, who is a sweet savor. That's what his, the, ta the table of incense represents, the sweet savor of Christ. And then verses 23 to 26, to wrap this up, we see the doors of the temple. Again, when you think of doors, Think of Christ. Christ is the door. When you hear windows, he's the light. Windows were designed to let in light and air. When you think of palm trees, think of Christ, the tree of life. And when you think of the cherubim, they were in the presence of, of God, the presence of Christ to serve him at his beck and call. But here are the doors. <clears throat> it says in the temple and the sanctuary had two doors. And the doors had two leaves apiece, two turning leaves, two leaves for the one door and two leaves for the other door. And there were made on them, on the doors of the temple, cherubims and palm trees, like as were made upon the walls. And there were thick planks upon the face of the porch without. And there were narrow windows and palm trees on the one side and on the other side, on the sides of the porch and upon the side chambers of the house and thick planks. So here the doors had two panels. That's what's being described. And there's all kinds of commentary as to what these two panels may have represented. I know Christ is the door. There's no question. And by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He is the door of salvation. But you can get into some commentators, they really get speculating where the one door represented the Lord's Supper and the other represents baptism, the two ordinances. And that's how they pursue it. But I believe just as the two the, the cherubim, the cherub with the face of man and the face of a lion, there's two. Here, the two parts of the door represent the two parts of Christ's nature as God and as man. It took both for him to be the salvation of his people and thereby 
the priests were to enter in. We as priests come boldly into the presence of God through him who is both God and man. And the wooden canopy that was on the front, once more, think about wood. Think about where they would have gotten this wood, acacia wood, a, a enduring wood. Well, it would have been from a tree that was planted. And then once it grew up, the tree was cut down and the wood taken and here it was made as part of the paneling. Well, that's a picture of Christ as well and his humanity coming into this world and laying down his life, being planted in this earth. And his temple, that is his church, being paneled with all that pertained to him as the God-man. So all the way through here, I see the God-man. I see pictures of the God-man. And I believe that we can learn much in this about how God has purposed to glorify his son through what's described here. We'll pick up in chapter 42 next time, the Lord willing. Gracious Father, I do thank you for this word. It encourages us First of all, to look to you for wisdom by your spirit to understand the symbolism that we're reading here and not just take it in a natural sense, but to see all of how this typifies your blessed son and his glory and his perfections as both God and man and that how none can enter into your presence except by him through this means. So I thank you that you've given us this word that we might be diligent students, that we might be like the Bereans, studying these things to see whether they be so. And our prayer is that you would give us eyes to see Christ. Continue to bless us as we meet together and continue at this time of worship. And we give you the praise in Christ's precious name. Amen.